Welcome to the Calvary Church Podcast, where we strive to lead people into an overflowing life with Jesus. Join us as we explore inspiring messages, engaging stories, and thought-provoking conversations that uplift your spirit and deepen your faith. Whether you're at home, on the go, or anywhere in between, we're glad you're here. Let's dive in. So today, you know, we're starting a new series. You know, one of the great struggles we see in our world today is with what does my, what is my, what shapes my identity? How, how am I shaped by what I do? And if, if you haven't been with us this last month, we've been walking through uh, Luke chapter 10 and uh, this, this incredible teaching that Jesus was doing through one of the most well-known parables in Luke's gospel, the parable of the good Samaritan. Uh, This month, though, we're going to continue that deep dive into Luke chapter 10 with the teaching that Jesus does uh, right after that parable. Last month, we looked at how important it is to take responsibility for the neighbors around us, for the people that God has put in our lives. And and it's so important, appropriate, that, that the story that follows this teaching was a lesson that Jesus shared with two very important people in his life, two ladies named Mary and Martha, two very good friends of his. Mary and Martha were sisters They lived in Bethany, which was just outside of the city of Jerusalem. Their brother was probably the most famous of them. Uh, His name was Lazarus, and if you know the story, maybe you don't, but Jesus would call Lazarus out of the grave at one point. This is one of his great miracles. And that was Mary and Martha's brother. Now, this, uh, this home that Mary and Martha lived in was a very common place for Jesus and sometimes his disciples to retreat to for rest. It was outside the hustle and bustle of Jerusalem. It was in Bethany. And, and they would oftentimes come here to, to, to get away from the, the, the busyness of their ministry. And in this story, we're walking through over these next five weeks throughout the month of June, we see this struggle play out in real time that so many of us face today. It's the struggle with our identity and ultimately what defines our identity. Now, I'm convinced this is actually one of the greatest hurdles and struggles that's present in our world today. Bigger than poverty, injustice, or natural disasters. Millions and millions of people today struggle with their identity and what their identity is ultimately built upon. And I don't care how old you are or how young you are, so many struggle with their identity. And and the truth is, when our identity is skewed or uncertain, the direction of our lives becomes uncertain. And, And here's a simple idea of this is our identity drives our direction. Our identity drives our direction. Sometimes we get this backwards and we think, well, the direction I'm going in, that's my identity. I'm an alcoholic, that's my identity. Or, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, constantly in debt, that's my identity. Or I can't carry a good job or you know, hold a healthy relationship or, or I can't do these things. Like that direction that my life is in, that is my identity. But identity should drive our direction. You see, this is an understandable battle that we, we face, that so many face. Because there are so many ways to define our lives and ways that our worth as a human being can be measured. From what we do and how effective we are at what we do. I mean, we're in school, we get grades. You're you're at work, you get bonuses. We're defined by what we do and what we're producing. To to the people we spend time with or associate with or connected with, they can define us. Or, Or even the stuff we have, the neighborhood we live in, the car that we drive. And that's not to mention the family you're part of and how they define you or, or the pressures that you feel to become something specific or how society tries to define who you are or what you should do, what you should become. This is a lifelong struggle to be defined by the right things for the right reasons and in the right direction. And for most of us, the easiest thing to define us The easiest thing to allow our identity to be based upon are the things that are the easiest to measure or or the things that bring about the most immediate results. This is why the majority of people become defined by what they do, by what they produce, what they do at work, what their lives accomplish, what their desires, passions, or emotions are that they possess. It's logical that we become defined by what we do. After all, a hammer, a screwdriver, a shovel, they're all defined by what they do. But the the truth is, we're not tools, we're people. We're not inanimate objects, we're people. 
And we often forget this, that we possess something that objects don't possess. We have a soul. We have a divine purpose. Our lives carry deeper meaning than just what we do or what we produce. We're, we're more than that. We're more than just what we do, the titles that we carry. And just for a second here, bear with me for a second, okay? I know I'm not supposed to walk off a platform. This is like, what is he doing? Um, you are not defined by what you do. You know, Jason, you're an insurance agent, commissioner, a dad, a husband. You're not defined by that, though, right? Like, we're more than that. Car- Carla here does an amazing job as a physical therapist and helping people and caring for people and loving people. But she's a mom, too. But you're not defined by that. Like, your identity isn't defined by that. Pa- Paul over here is an incredible former member of the Marines. I always joke with him and, and say he's in the Air Force or the Navy, but I couldn't do that today. But, but you're, you're an amazing husband and father and grandfather, but you're more than that. Like, we're more than what we do. I, I'm a pastor, and do you know how hard it is sometimes to not let what I do as a pastor to define me? Uh, when I get together with other pastors, you know the questions they ask are like, how many people are in your church? What, wh- how much money do you give? Or what do you do? For, like, uh, I, it's so easy to be defined by those things. I'm a husband. I'm a father. You, you have your own things, like things that you do that define you. Maybe you have a title at work. Maybe you have a certain pay scale or you live in a certain neighborhood or you drive a certain car or you wear certain clothes or you have a certain, you know, uh, level of, of credentials or degrees. And those things all so easily define us. And for the majority of the world, we allow those things to define us. They become our identity. I am this, whatever your job is. I am this, whatever you've produced. Look at all these accomplishments I've had. Or look at all these things that I've fallen short of, that, that I, I can't accomplish, that I haven't done, that I've tried so hard to. But, but can I tell you something today? Those things don't define you. It's, it's a struggle with such a difficulty. I know. Because our world tells us that you are what you do. You are what you produce. But, but when we read this book we call the Bible, so often it has a very different perspective than what we're told in society. And in this case, it definitely does. That you aren't defined by what you do. Does what you do matter? Yeah, it sure does. Like, if you say I'm a follower of Jesus and you go, like, curse out that person and, like, punch them in the face, like, that, that does matter, okay? Like, we shouldn't be doing those things. But, but what we do or don't do isn't what our identity is based upon. Our identity has to be based upon something bigger and deeper than that. Jesus didn't go to the cross and die so he could be defined by what he did, and so you could be defined by what you do. He went to the cross. He died on the cross so that you could actually discover the real reason you're here. That was the real reason he was here, that you could discover your deeper, godly, God-given purpose. And this story we're going to look at throughout this month, we see this unique Such a unique perspective presented. It's a perspective that's a little bit eye-opening and and can be incredibly challenging to how we were raised or even what we are told is most important or should be most important. And we're going to pick up Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Just give you a little background. Jesus and his disciples have just come off a really busy season of ministry. And as they often did, they travel to Bethany, to the home of Mary and Martha, to rest and recharge. They arrive at the home of Mary and Martha and they receive their normal welcome. Here's, we're picking up in verse 38. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Verse 39, he had a, she had, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, 
I always hear Marsha, Marsha when I read this, but <clears throat> it's Martha, Martha, okay? Uh, the Bible predates the uh, Brady Bunch, if you don't know that. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. We're going to walk through this incredibly rich story verse by verse over this next month. Because what I've found uh, is that some of the greatest meaning comes from the things that we settle in, pause, and meditate on, not the things we rush through. And, and this month, we're going to kind of pause and, and linger in these few verses and say, okay, what, what meaning comes from this story? Because there's so much meaning in what Jesus is doing and his interaction with Mary and Martha here that, can I be honest, we desperately need. Because we rush through so much. We rush through life. In Psalms, it says that we should be still and know that he is God. And over this next month, you know, it's June, it's summer. We can breathe a little bit unless you have allergies and then maybe you can't, but, you know, we can breathe a little bit and, like, let's, let's, let's pause for a moment and, and listen to what God has to say. And I want to pray here in a second. Before we do that, can you just close your eyes for a second? Take a deep breath. Breathe out. Let's just pray. God, I pray in these next few moments that you would speak to us through your word. God, we thank you for the story we've just read. And God, I pray from this story that you would bring such wisdom, insight into our lives. God, we're doing our very best to live the life you want us to live. But God, we need your word. We need those important reminders. We need those promptings that only your Holy Spirit can bring. And I pray that you would do that today, God, in our lives. The Lord, that the things that define us, the things that we allow to identify us, God, aren't the things that are external, but internal, Lord, the the things that you've deposited in our hearts and you've called us to do, the people you have made us to be. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So today, we want to look at just this one verse in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Here, I'm going to read it one more time. It says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, uh, this could easily just be a, a simple transition sentence from the teaching that Jesus gave on the Good Samaritan, which we had talked about last month, just the verses right before this, into the story of his time with Mary and Martha. Like, it's just a transition statement, almost like it's a, it's a throwaway statement. But, but I don't think there are throwaway statements or verses in the Bible. Every verse has importance and meaning. And, and in this verse, we see such importance uh, of what's taking place. Uh, this isn't this throwaway, but there's something that we can learn about these verses. And, and here's the simple idea that I want to share with you today. It's this, that your identity, your identity is more shaped by what you're becoming than what you're producing. Your identity is more shaped by what you're becoming than what you're producing. I don't care what your bottom line is or your bank account is. I don't care, you know, what title you carry or what you've accomplished. Your identity isn't based on those things. It's based on what you're becoming. Are you becoming the right person? We have walked through a season uh, in our country over the last five years where we have oftentimes sacrificed what we want in an outcome for the sake of what we're actually becoming. We are called to be followers of Jesus first. And what we become should be our priority, not some outcome that we want or desire. Can I just be honest with you? Just a side note, this isn't in my notes, so this is extra. It doesn't matter who becomes president in the United States this year. Jesus is still on the throne. Okay? And... And I know, I know, I know that there are a lot of opinions just in this room, especially online, about who should be and who shouldn't be, okay? Those are great, great opinions. But don't ever, ever, ever let those opinions supersede what you're called to become. Don't sacrifice an opinion, a comment online, a post, uh, something you say to someone for the sake of what you want at the detriment of who you're becoming. Remember who you're called to become. Because our identity, our identity ultimately is more shaped by what you're becoming 
than what you're producing. You see, before we get to the battle in this verse, in this story that unfolds of what really defined Mary and Martha, it's important to understand this idea that our identity in, in, is first and foremost defined by the things we welcome into our lives, the things that we open the door to. This might sound really elementary to you, but it's an important distinction to highlight. There are a lot of things that we can flippantly open the door of our hearts to and think nothing of it. It's not that big of a deal. Another way to ask this question might be this. Not simply what are you welcoming, but what are you allowing to influence your life? What is influencing your life the most? For those of you with kids, this is a really important question to ask about your kids. What is influencing your children? There are more things that can influence your children today than has ever been present in the world. (laughs) Um, From social media to things online to television to friends, there's so much that can influence your children. Are you aware of what is influencing your children? Are you aware of the things you're open? I'm not saying that to scare you. This isn't a, you know, a fear thing. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm saying as parents, you're entrusted with those children. Are you aware of what's influencing, what they're welcoming into their lives? A couple weeks ago, we talked about the the importance of taking responsibility for what, what God places in front of you. That God places needs and opportunities in front of you to love your neighbor, to care for them. But we also need to take responsibility for what we allow to shape our own lives, for what we allow to influence the lives of our children. You see, if, if you're not aware of what shapes you, you'll be shaped by every trend and stream of culture. You'll, you'll, you'll become what James writes in James chapter 1, verse 6, that, that we become like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Now, does this mean that we should step out of culture, insulate ourselves, and retreat to some Christian bubble, like we're going to create this Christian commune and we're just going to all live there and, and stay away from this evil world so that we can stay pure and holy? Is that what we're called to do? Absolutely not. Read the book of Acts. That's not what God's people did. We're not here to insulate ourselves, but we should recognize what's influencing us. We aren't called to retreat from culture. Instead, we are called to shape culture. You are a culture creator. In your workplace, in your home, in your neighborhood, you are called to create a culture. We need to stop being thermometers. And what I mean by that is Christians have become thermometers where we we start pointing out all that's wrong with the world. That's bad. That's evil. We don't like that. We don't like that. Stop doing that. We don't need to do that. We are called to be thermostats. We set the temperature. We create the culture. We don't just adapt to the culture, we create the culture. How do we create the culture? We do things with excellence. You should be the best employee in your workplace. You should be the best supervisor in your your company. You should be the best student in your school. Why? Because those who excel and give their best are allowed to create the culture and set the tone. That's what we're called to do. So we don't retreat from the culture, we shape the culture. We shouldn't be the ones being influenced. We should be the ones influencing the world around us. And as followers of Jesus, while we shouldn't be defined by what we do or produce, we should allow what we do or produce to reflect the God who does define us. So what are you opening your life to? What what is influencing your words, your actions, your dreams, and your intentions? Have you ever done an influence assessment? Ask yourself, the questions of how am I being influenced? What, assessing what is impacting my life, the things that I watch, the things that I listen to, the things that I read. I promise that when you identify what is influencing you and what your door is open to, you'll see a direct line to what is shaping your identity. This month, we are, we are wrestling with this tension that's present. Nearly every corner of the earth Are we defined by what we're doing or what we're becoming? The struggle to be shaped and allow our identity to be built on the right things isn't just a new battle. It's not something that just happened in 2024. It's something that has existed since God created the first man and woman. And and, and what a person's identity is built upon has always been influenced, if not fully determined, by what they welcome into their life and the voices that they are willing to listen to. In in this story of Mary and Martha, there's a lot of negative press about Martha's actions and and posture 
while Jesus was in her home. When you read throughout the whole story, you know, there's a lot to be said about, well, Mary was doing one thing and Martha was doing the other and we should be like Mary. And we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But, but this verse that we're looking at today is pretty profound. Here's, I'll read it again, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. What's really interesting when you read this story is Mary isn't the one that's mentioned that opened her home to him. Martha is. Martha opened her home to Jesus. This is so big. This is such a big part of the story. While eventually Martha may have gotten a little off track in what she was defining herself by, what she was obsessing about, or what she was uh, being guided by, she welcomed Jesus in. Because here's why this is important. We're not perfect. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, you're not perfect. You can, if, if, especially if it's your spouse, you can give them a little nudge. You're not so perfect either, you know. <laughs> We're not perfect. <clears throat> Here's the reality. We all fall short. This is what I love about our church. Like, we're, we're, we're a church of imperfect people finding our way. Do we get it right all the time? Absolutely not. We're, we're finding our way. None of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. That doesn't mean we just, like, say, well, then let's just do whatever we want. No. But we recognize, like, this is a journey. We're not perfect. We're going to fall short. We're going to mess up. We're sometimes going to make the wrong decisions or even sometimes we can have the wrong motives. When we are defined by what we do rather than what we're becoming, when we fall short, when we do the wrong things, that failure becomes fatal because we're defined by it, right? Like, when, when getting that 4.0 defines you, 3.99 is devastating. When, when having that title that you've, you've worked your entire life for defines you, getting the spot right below that is devastating. When, when you are defined by what you do and you fall short, which we're human, we make mistakes, it's fatal. But when we are willing to welcome the right voices, have the right influence, when we welcome Jesus into the picture, even when we fall short, even when we mess up, we can get ourselves back on track. Why? Because our identity is more shaped by what we're becoming than what we're producing. And it's so interesting in this story that Mary is considered by most as the focal point of this story. And yet, it's Martha's willingness to open her home to Jesus that sets the stage for this important lesson. Mary's the focal point, but Martha's the one that opens the door. See, here's my question for you today. What, what are you opening the door of your life to? Are you even aware of what you're opening the door of your life to? There's so many doors in our life. So many doors in your life. There's the door of everything that you surf on social media. There's the door of the people that you allow to speak into your life and that you lean into. There's, there's the door of the things you just listen to and start to buy into. What are you opening your door to? What are you allowing to influence your life? With all the noise in our world, it's never been more important that we identify and recognize what are we opening the door to? Because we can open the door to the wrong things sometimes. Every door that opens isn't the right door. Every voice that wants to speak into your life isn't necessarily the right voice. Have you ever done an influence assessment? And I want to ask a few questions. And when you came in today, for those here in person, we, we gave you a card. And it, it kind of walks through some of these questions for you to kind of process on your own. Uh, these, these are some questions that can help shape your identity, influence your life. The, f- the first question is this. What do I do to refresh or recharge? What do I do to refresh or recharge? We see Jesus here is refreshing, recharging at Mary and Martha's home. What do I do to refresh, recharge? Why is that important? Uh, what does that have to do with my identity? Because when you're at your lowest, the things you go to will begin to shape what you become once you get stronger. Um, this is oftentimes the moments that we are most susceptible to, to uh, temptation, to doing the wrong things. Uh, the acronym is HALT. When you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, 
when you're tired. When you're hungry, you're angry, you're lonely, you're tired. That's when you're, you're weakest. And sometimes you make the worst decisions. I don't know if you've noticed that before. Like when I'm at my hungriest, that's when I will eat the most cookies. <laughs> I probably shouldn't, but that's when... I, you, put, you put a box of no-bakes in front of me and I'm hungry, bad things. That box will like get destroyed. Um, when you're hungry, you're angry, you're lonely, you're tired. You make the worst decisions. What do you do to refresh or recharge? When you're at those low moments, how do you bounce back? That's a big influence in your life. You might not realize it, but it's a big influence in your life. Like, is that the moments that you self-medicate? Are those the moments that you blow up on everyone around you? How do you refresh and recharge? What are the things that you invest into your life when your tank is empty? It's important. If you're not aware of that, if you don't see the patterns of that, or you do see the patterns of that, you're like, it's okay. It's not, it's not okay. Try this. When your gas tank in your car gets down to that like E point where the light comes on, put your hose in the gas tank and just run it for a little bit and then put gas in it. See how that goes. Not going to go well, okay? I'm not a mechanic, but I know that much. Not going to go well. When your tank is empty, what are you putting into the tank to refresh and recharge? How do you refresh? That's a big part of, of, of what influences you. Maybe you need to rethink that. The second question, where do I find answers in my life? Where do I find answers in my life? When the world gets confusing, when things are uncertain, when I have big decisions to make in my life, when I'm just trying to, pro where do I find answers in my life? What do you turn to? Who do you turn to? Is, do, you, do, you, do you flip on Fox News or MSNBC? Is that where you get all your answers? If, if either one of those or CNN or I could keep going. Any of those are, are your go-to for answers. That's, that's probably not a good option because the reality is they're just trying to get your attention so they can make money. They're not actually trying to tell you truth, okay? Um, where do you get your answers? Where, where do you find answers when you're uncertain? If it's something that's not solid like God's word, which I would highly recommend that be the starting point, um, is that how's that working out for you? Where do you, get, where do you get your answers? Where do you find answers in your life? And the third question is who, who are the biggest voices in my life really? I put the really because you know the stock. In. Who are the biggest voice? Jesus is the biggest voice in my life. Right, right there with God and the Holy Spirit. They are the biggest voices. In, okay, that's good. Who are the biggest voices in your life Really? Who are the people really that you're leaning into that have your ear? Who are the biggest voices in my life really? You know, there have been periods in my life that I've had to recalibrate the relationships in my life, sometimes step away from people, not because they're evil necessarily, because they're not the right voices for my life. I remember in college I had a really good friend and um, had been a very good friend, but he just was so negative, cynical, and the things he would say about people behind their backs. I was just like, man, you're a good friend, but this is not the voice I need to have in my life. And I had to step away from that relationship. You know, there's times that we have to walk away from people because they're not the right influence, they're not the right voice in our life. So that doesn't mean we avoid them altogether, but that they don't have a prominent voice in our life. Who are the strongest, most influential voices in your life, really, not, not what you wish for, but that really have, an e have your ear. This is a, an influence assessment. Why is this so important? Because who we're listening to, who is shaping us, more impacts what we're becoming than anything we're going to produce. What do I do to refresh or recharge? Where do I find answers in my life? And who are the biggest voices in my life, really? Doing an assess assessment like this gives you a picture of what is influencing you, what is shaping your identity. Because as I mentioned, our identity is shaped by what we're becoming more than what we're producing. So what can shape your identity to be in line with who God created you to be, who he longs for you to be, and he's beckoning you to become? I don't know what your you know, experience with faith is or, or religion or, or church. I don't, I don't know what your background is maybe. 
you know, you've been in church since the moment you were born, like you were literally born in a pew and like never left. Or, or, or maybe, maybe this is the very first time you've ever walked into a church or you've ever watched a, a church service online and, and this is all new to you. Regardless of where you are, let me give you a little bit of an insight. God isn't like running around for you to chase him, to discover what like you're supposed to be. My, my, my three-year-old daughter, she loves to, she, she's done this, I understand this is cute, it's not being mean or harsh, but she loves to, to come up to me and go, doop, doop, dada, and, and she's saying stupid, okay? That's her way of saying stupid. And she's laughing the whole time she says it. She goes, doop, doop, dada, and she goes like this, and then she runs, and she wants me to chase her. And, and she wants me to chase after her. It's just a fun game, right? God isn't running around hoping that we'll chase him, trying to stay away from us trying to be elusive. No, no. God is beckoning us. He's calling us. He has this life that you were created for. In John 10, it says that you, that Jesus' goal, his dream, his hope, is that you would live life to the full. Not that you would would experience what the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy, but you would live life and life to the full. Like God created you for something. And he's beckoning you. He's calling you. To not, to not just produce the right things, but to become the right person. So, so the question is, well, how do we do that? And, and there's five things I want to share with you. Five things, and you're like, whoa, five things, that's too much. These are, these are our values as a church. These are things that aren't about what you're doing, but where you're positioning yourself to grow. The first one is this, that we start by seeking God through his word and his spirit. And understand, this isn't some corporate talk. Uh, this isn't values like, oh, just, you know, put these on the wall and like we just, no, this is, these are practical ways that we position ourselves to be shaped, to our, let our identity be shaped into what God wants us to be. We start by seeking God through his word and his spirit. What does that mean? It means that, that the voices you're listening to, the things that are influencing you, should first and foremost be God's word And his spirit that speaks through you, through his word. How is God speaking to you? You're like, I don't hear from God. Okay, well, have you taken opportunity to practice the the, the action of being still, being still and knowing God? Read his word. Open the Bible. Take a moment to meditate on God. What are you speaking to me? God, how are you impact? What are you trying to share with me from your word? We start there. If we start anywhere else, we're already off base. We start there. Start, if if you don't have a regular rhythm in your life of reading God's word, of taking time to ask God to speak to you through his word, that's your starting point. If you want to change your identity, you want to to, to influence who you become, start by seeking God through his word and his spirit. The second one is we grow best in the context of relationships. This is why we do life groups as a church. This isn't a big commercial for life groups, but this is why we do life groups. This is also why we gather in person. Since the beginning of the church 2,000 years ago, the church gathered. And you can watch online, and man, what a blessing it is to get to watch a service online. But the end goal is that God would put you in relationship, right relationship with people who can sometimes uh, sharpen you, which requires some tension sometimes, can encourage you. We, we need that. We need those interactions, those conversations, those discussions. We need that relationship. We need the people who aren't exactly clones of us that can help us discover who God wants us to be and what God's word says. You're gonna grow best, not just when you start with God's word and allow his spirit to speak to you, but when you find yourself in right relationships, healthy relationships that can help fuel what God is speaking to you. The friends that you need are the ones who say, man, what is God speaking to you? How can I cheer you on for that? Those are the people that we need in our lives. So we grow best in the context of relationships. The third is we move forward together in teams. We aren't defined by what we produce. That doesn't mean we shouldn't produce anything. God's people aren't lazy people. God's people are workers. As as children of God, we're called to change the world. That takes work. In the book of James, it says that that, um, faith without works is dead. 
If you misinterpret that, you would think that our, our, our works are defined, our, our works define our faith. That's not the truth. It's not what James is saying. Our faith, us positioning ourselves in the word of God and being changed by the word of God and, and growing in the context of relationship should produce something. There are so many different ways to serve at Calvary. Within our walls, outside of our walls. As I mentioned, we have two teams all going two different directions in the world right now. Uh, we have more teams going throughout this year. There's so many different ways to serve. You're like, I don't know if I can go to Africa. Okay, but maybe you can stand at the door and greet someone and be that smiling face that helps someone who's going through hell on earth just have the will to take another step. Like, maybe you can do that. Maybe you're good with computers and you're like, hey, I'm, I love sitting behind a computer. I can't stand on a platform, but I could run a computer and help stream a service to hundreds of people. Hey, maybe you can do that. Like, God can use what you're wired to do for his glory. And it's not about just, hey, I need to get as much as I can and, and, and fill my life with his word and his spirit and, and, and get relationships so I can grow. At some point, you have to shift that it's not about you. And if our identity is about making me the best version of me, then, then maybe Jesus isn't fully guiding us because it's not just about me. So we grow best in the kinds of relationships. We move forward together in teams. It's about being part of a team to serve, to make a difference. The third, our fourth one is we generously invest all what we've been given. We generously invest what we've been given. That God gives us and pours into our lives and we give it away. I don't know what your posture on that is. Everyone has different postures. I do know this, that we are called to be generous people because we are to reflect the, the heart of the Father. Where it says, for God so loved the world, he gave. We are called to give. That's not just when an offering plate is passed. That's also when we see someone in need. That's also when the Holy Spirit prompts us to pay for that person behind us in the drive through line. That's, that's also when you see someone at the grocery store that's just struggling trying to pay, their, pay the, the bill for the groceries and you step in and pay for it. Like, th- that's, that's being a generous person, not just when, it's, when everyone's watching, but also when God just prompts you. And the fifth one is we engage our local and global community to transform our world. And uh, this is a passion of ours because if we're just filling ourselves up, if we're just experiencing the word of God, if we're just allowing our identity to be based on on who I am, but not, God, how can you use me? We've missed the great commission. We've missed the whole purpose that Jesus said in Matthew 28, to go and to make disciples of all nations. We aren't called to be a person or people that are inward focused, and it's all about me and all about us. What happens when our eyes can look outward and say, God, change me, transform me, let my identity be in the right things. Let me become the man or the woman that you want me to be so that I can help others do the same. That's what we're called to do. And so worship team comes today. Each of these steps are less about what you're doing and more about where you're positioning yourself to grow and become who God made you to be. In Psalm 139, it says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't know what you say to yourself. I don't know what you see when you look in the mirror in the morning. But I can tell you what God's word says that God sees in you. He sees the product of something he fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, is what he made happening? Maybe not. But that's what he made it for. In our identity, the things that we chase, we so uh, often run after and strive to be, to, to be and to produce. Those aren't the things that identify us. We need, as followers of Jesus, we need to recalibrate a little bit and step back and say, okay, let's put aside the pressure to be defined, to have my identity based on what I'm producing what I'm accomplishing or what I have accomplished or have not accomplished. Let my identity be based on what I'm becoming. And my hope for you, I don't know what your hope for you is, but I I can tell you my hope for you is that you would become a child of God. Not just a nice person, 
not just a good person, a child of God. Because as a child of God, the Bible says that your identity is transformed. Paul writes that we are adopted into his family, that you are his son and his daughter, that he puts his name on you. I love uh, the end of Haggai. It says, he says, God says to Zerubbabel, I'm going to make you like my signet ring. And the signet ring was the symbol for a, a, a monarch that he would seal a declaration or a law. And without that seal, that signet ring, it didn't matter. It didn't mean anything. It wasn't worth the words on the paper. But with the signet ring, it carried the authority of that monarch. And if you had the signet ring, you carried the authority of what that ring represents. And, and God said to Zerubbabel, he says to you, I'm going to make you like my signet ring. You carry my identity. You walk in my authority. You experience my blessing, not for the sake of riches, for the sake of impact. This is what God wants for us. And throughout this month, I'm so excited to get to walk through. What does it look like to be more focused on what we're becoming than what we're doing? What does it look like to allow my identity to be grounded, to be planted in the right things? Not in the things that I stream, not in the, the things I scroll, not, not in the things that I swipe, but in the things that God has created me to be. What does that look like? And today I want to pray over you. And here's my prayer. My prayer is that God would make you a little uneasy. I know that's not the prayer you want me to pray. Just pray that everything will go great. No, I want to pray that God would make you a little uneasy. Uneasy with the status quo. Because the status quo is, man, I'm defined by what I do and produce. But that you would be uneasy and say, God, I need, to, I need to assess what is influencing my life. I need to be aware of what am I opening the door to in my life. Because my identity is worth that. Your identity is so important that Jesus went and died on the cross for that. He didn't just die so your sins could be forgiven and you could do this religious thing. He died so that you could be a child of God, so that your identity could be right. That's how important it is. And my hope is that you could be a little uneasy so that you could see the importance of that pursuit as well. Would you bow your heads with me this morning before we go? God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. God, that your word isn't just some empty uh, book of, of, of words that are out there that we try to gather or, or capture or understand. But Lord, your word is life-giving. God, that your word is God-breathed, is useful for our, our building up, our correction at time, our, 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 our guidance. And God, I pray today that you would allow your word to come alive in our hearts, Lord, that you would make us uneasy, uneasy with the status quo. God, that the identity the identity you have placed within us, Lord, that we would discover it. And Lord, that, that, that we would allow the things that influence us to shape us to become who you want us to be. God, not just for the sake of ourselves, but Lord, to make a difference in the world. God, let us position ourselves in your word, that we start by seeking your word. We start by, by fostering a relationship with your spirit. God, let us grow in this context of relationships. God, let us be willing to use the gifts you have given us, Lord, to be part of a team bigger than ourselves, Lord, that we can make a difference outside of ourselves. Lord, let us be generous in church and outside of church with what you have given us. And God, let us not shrink back, but Lord, let us engage the world around us, whether that's for some of us to go on a trip, whether that's for some of us, Lord, just to be willing to pray with our coworker. God, let us be people who don't shrink back, but step up and those opportunities present themselves. Holy Spirit, move in us. Move through us. Transform our identity today, I pray. And transform, Lord, the identity that we walk in tomorrow at work, or at school, at home. God, let us define ourselves by what we're becoming, not simply what we're doing. Thank you, God, for your love and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the moments that you overlook our faults and our shortcomings. And God, you stick with us. You don't give up on us. God, I thank you that there are those that are here today. God, that we're ready to give up. And you didn't give up on them. God, I pray 
for those that are here, those that are watching online, Lord, that they have so believed that you have given up on them. God, let these words right now be a reminder. You have not given up on them. You are pursuing them. You are beckoning them to the life you created them for. Thank you, God, for that love, that pursuit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Thank you for joining us today on the Calvary Church Podcast. We hope you found encouragement and inspiration in today's message. Remember, you are not alone on your faith journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. For more information about our church, upcoming events, and ways to get involved, visit our website at calvaryirwin.com or follow us on social media at Calvary Irwin. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you. Have a wonderful week.